to the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network's Community Conversation Series. My name is Brittany Bathia, the Director of Communications and Dissemination, and I'm honored to welcome Dr. Dominic Mack, the Director of the National Center for Primary Care at Morehouse School of Medicine, to give a brief overview of our program's goals. Dr. Mack? Thank you, Brittany. Again, welcome to everyone. We appreciate that you join us this evening for this well, um, this valuable um, information that you get tonight. There are over 23 million children who have mixed their routine va vaccinations across this world. And as there are countries that really don't have the resources in a country such as the United States that have the resources, we are debating county by county, school system by school system, and home by home, the value of the vaccination. Now, scientifically, we know it's valuable. Tonight, we will discuss some of these barriers, but also discuss solutions to overcome these barriers. The most important thing is that we save our children. We save them from the sickness of COVID-19, but also the mortality, because we know, especially children in underserved communities are at higher risk for getting sick and also dying from COVID-19. So we're really thankful to our panelists tonight to share this information to you. Um, scientifically, we're gonna talk about the science, but also what we want to equip you, equip you with is knowledge um, so you can have a backdrop drop and understand the environment, which is going on scientifically, but also with some solutions, practical solutions for your communities. And we hope to have a rich discussion about those communities that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and how can we get our children into our vaccination, into vaccinations. So again, I welcome you and I thank you to the audience and look forward to a, a valuable discussion tonight. Thank you, Dr. Mack. And now we'll hear a special message between Dr. Daniel Dawes and Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith to discuss the topic of equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. My name is Daniel Dawes, and I'm the Executive Director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. I want to welcome everyone to our special webinar series intended to engage our community in conversation around COVID-related issues disproportionately impacting people of color, people with disabilities, and other groups. The Morehouse School of Medicine's National COVID-19 Resiliency Network was created to provide awareness of critical health information and linkage to services to help families and individuals recover from difficulties that may have been caused or worsened by the coronavirus pandemic. Today, we are privileged to be joined by a very special friend and exceptional leader in the movement to advance health equity and mitigate the impact that this COVID pandemic is having on communities across the United States. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, who currently serves as the senior advisor to the White House COVID-19 response team and chair of the Presidential COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. When she's not advising the White House and our federal agencies, Dr. Nunes Smith serves as the Associate Dean for Health Equity Research, the CNH Long Professor of Medicine, Public Health and Management, and the Director of the Equity Research and Innovation Center at Yale. Thank you so much much for joining us tonight, Dr. Nunez Smith. Oh, thank you. It is my pleasure to be here, friend. Just so thrilled to be in conversation with you. I want to thank you, especially as well as Morehouse, for just the tremendous leadership doing a really difficult time. We're not out of the pandemic yet. We're going to talk about that, but thanks for all you're doing. Well, thank you, and, and you honor us with your presence this evening. So let me, let me begin our discussion uh, by posing this question to you first. You know, as you know, there is no denying the fact that COVID-19 has changed everyday life for all of us in a multitude of ways, and that our country is experiencing a dark and historical moment. 
As the death toll reaches or reaches nearly 610,000, the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bared inequities within the U.S. health system and our society at large. And as you know, people with disabilities, people of color, they bear an unequal burden. As researchers have reported, these groups are more likely to contract the disease, three times as likely to end up in the hospital and twice as likely or more, depending on the group, to die from it. While there have been challenges, there's certainly been many successes as well. So would you share with us what strategies the administration has implemented to ensure equitable access to the vaccine? Yes, you know, let me tell you, I just always have to take a moment when I hear the statistics because yeah. they're hard, they're hard to Absolutely. hear. Um, and, you know, we often don't acknowledge, I think, the grief and the suffering behind wow. those numbers. And so we know, right, that in our communities, we are carrying that burden um, and the mental health toll that takes, right, grieving for loved ones, um, you know, we have to talk more about long COVID as well. So those who have contracted COVID and dealing with lingering symptoms also a burden our communities, the economic impact, the educational impact, it's, it's a lot. Um, and so to hold that, and at the same time to say, you know, President Biden came in, Vice President Harris came in, the charge was clear from them to all of us, to the entire administration, we're gonna have a whole of government approach to COVID-19. We're gonna make sure that this is fast work because there's urgency to this, it's going to be efficient. It's going to be equitable, right? And to underscore that over and over again. And so just in the first couple of weeks of that administration, already President Biden launched several vaccination channels. Now, these are ways the federal government was getting vaccination directly to the people who needed it most. And so standing up partnerships with our friendly qualified community health centers and community health centers all around the country, thinking about those large vaccination sites, but placing them in neighborhoods that were the hardest hit. You know, thinking about the retail pharmacy programs, partnering with them, also saying equity is going to be at the core. Where are we going to be located? Knowing that the vaccination venue is necessary, insufficient, and of course, mobile vaccination. That was the first phase. And the work has continued. People are working just around the clock in the administration. I mean, all over, but certainly uh, the president has made it really clear this is Priority number one. And so moving on to make sure structural barriers are addressed. You know, everyone knows too well. We have to have conversations about things like transportation, right? Really important. Child care, paid time off. I mean, we heard over and over again, we're honored in the White House to be in conversation with many, many folks who are showing up every day. You know, you have been gracious enough to come tell us your wisdom, your expertise, to share with us the knowledge you have about what's happening on the front lines in the vaccination campaign and responding and responding through partnerships that are private sector, include partnerships with philanthropy. You know, this is always the key, the collaboration, the partnership, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, kind of everyone stepping up in this moment. And now the phase of work that we're in, really important we know, vaccination, ease, convenience, is critically important. But we gotta fight the misinformation, the disinformation that's out there. That's the greatest threat right now. We have to make sure that people have not just accurate information, the vaccines are effective, they work, right? And even now we know we're watching Delta and other variants, but the vaccinations confer a high degree of protection, keep people out of the hospital, keep people alive, right? So we know that, but also, you know, people are wondering about charges and costs and vaccination is free. Proof of assurance is not needed, documentation, does not matter, right? No government issued ID is needed. So making sure that we're getting out there working so closely with trusted messengers. This work is person by person right now, right? Hyper local work. Everybody knows in the equity space, we always have to begin and end there. And I just wanna say thank you because I know out of all the folks who are joining us now, each one of you, what you're doing is making a huge difference. When you stop and talk to somebody about your vaccination story, you're making a huge, huge difference. You're saving a life. And every life is worth that time for that one-on-one -on -one investment. And that's where we are right now. Well, it certainly sounds like, um, you know, uh, you and the Biden administration have been quite busy. I, I think that would be an understatement, right? And, uh, and I want to thank you for your leadership in this space and trying to keep us all safe. You know, uh, I'd like to pivot a bit. 
now to include a discussion on children specifically. Uh, how are you planning to make children or make sure that children who are 12 and older also have equitable access? And, and how can parents access the vaccine for their children? Could you give us some insights into that? Absolutely. So, right, you know, the point now is that in, in the U.S., for everyone 12 and over, you're eligible, and the supply is there. So important. But we know it's got to be easy, convenient, really important. we got to meet people where they are. You know, it's wonderful to be able to go to your local pharmacy. We're continuing that partnership there to be able to get vaccinated. We know our local pharmacists uh, much of the time can ask information, uh, ask questions, get information we need from the pharmacists in our communities, but also from the clinicians we know. And for so many of us, I'm a parent as well, right? We're very used to talking to our pediatric providers or family doc and family providers about our children's health. And so making sure that vaccination is available in those locations as well. And so in this phase, making sure vaccine is there in doctor's offices around the country. So people can get vaccinated, again, places that they trust and where it's easy and where it's convenient. Um, we, we know, um, of course, that the, the challenges uh, are, are, are many and can be many for those who are trying to connect with vaccination. And so always paying attention to access is going to be number one and good information. And so when it comes to the younger folks among us, we want to make sure they have information from people they know and trust as well. So partner with many influencers um, and peers so that they are hearing in all those platforms, you know, I don't have to name them. If you're a parent of an adolescent, you know where our children are spending their time, but making sure they're getting good information um, where they are spending their time, meeting them where they are as well, and making sure it's easy and convenient for parents. Equity is going to be key for our children as well as for us, our adults. Well, thank you for that. And, and since we only have a few minutes left, I'd like to close by asking you, since this is a conversation with community members, if you would share with us how members of our community may engage with the Biden administration on efforts to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on their communities. Yeah, uh, and we started off at the top of our time together talking about this, right? And so, you know, we are in this COVID-19 moment and absolutely we wanna make sure that there is equity and we're hearing about that, that people are able to connect with all the COVID-19 resources, be it vaccine and vaccination, testing, you know, therapies for COVID-19, PPE, but this broader conversation, because we know the impacts and we know that this is a result of what has been intergenerational limitation, right, in terms of access to resource that's been systematic, that's been structural. And looking ahead, this is an opportunity, a moment uh, to address, really. And that is the charge of the president. How do we make sure that we mitigate now and moving forward the impact uh, from COVID-19 on communities that have often been minoritized and marginalized? Um, and medically underserved. And so we want to hear, there are phenomenal ideas in every corner. And so I want to invite people um, into this continued conversation that we're just starting today. Um, be sure to reach out, you know, whether it's to us on the COVID-19 response team in the White House, you know, or to the task force um, that we referenced earlier. We have monthly public facing meetings. We invite people to come in into the meeting and share public comment and perspective, and just to reach out to us and let us know what you're learning, what you're seeing, and what those good ideas are. You know, together is how we're going to get through this and to the other side. And I'm grateful, I'm grateful, grateful for the work we're all doing together as a collective. Um, this is the only way, but let me tell you, I have hope, I'm holding it, I'm holding optimism, I'm holding light and strength for us all because we can, we can get to the other side of the pandemic. Well, what powerful words to end on. And I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith for the privilege of your time. Uh, we appreciate you. And again, just letting you know that uh, as you fight for us, we also are um, fighting for you. And we thank you again for all that you do on our behalf. On behalf of the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network, we wish you a good night. Godspeed. Thanks again. Next, I'll turn it over to Meg Terrell from CNBC. 
as she introduces our dynamic speakers tonight. Well, thank you so much. I'm Meg Terrell. I'm the Senior Health and Science Reporter at CNBC, and I'm just delighted to get to have this conversation with our two wonderful panelists. Uh, we have uh, Morehouse School of Medicine's Dr. Lily Immergluck with us. She's a professor of microbiology, biochemistry, and immunology, and attending physician at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And Dr. Krista Marie Singleton, who's Senior Medical Advisor, Population Health and Healthcare Office and the Office of the Associate Director for Policy and Strategy at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, thank you both for taking the time to do this discussion tonight. And I want to ask everybody out there who's watching, submit your questions. We'll get the experts to answer them. And that is going to be the best part of this discussion. Um, so maybe we'll start off with Dr. Imre Gluck. Um, you know, we hear so much about this being such a risky disease for people who are older, but what is the risk to kids from COVID? So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this forum. I think it's really important as um, we move, uh, continue to move through this pandemic and we look at the populations that are still very vulnerable to acquiring or contracting COVID-19. And a big part of that is are there are children. And so when at the very beginning of this pandemic, the attention was focused on the vulnerable population, namely our older elderly population, uh, people who had uh, high risk factors. Uh, but as we see those populations actually becoming uh, proportionally vaccinated, now we're looking at the uh, population that remain vulnerable as far as they're not able to get vaccinated because there's currently not an FDA EUA approved vaccine available to them. So these, uh, the information is, is that it has to shift. We are seeing children hospitalized. Uh, granted, again, a lot of our children have asymptomatic infection or mild infection at presentation. The things that we don't know about SARS-CoV-2 is the consequences of it. As we start to learn more uh, and more with every day, we see that there are uh, consequences post-infection. So you all may have heard about the multi-inflammatory syndrome, which involves multi-organs in our children. And yes, we do see deaths associated with this. We see kids who are hospitalized and severely hospitalized because of that. So those are some of the consequences that hadn't been kind of focused on in the early phase of the pandemic. But at this point, I think we do need to give it the attention it deserves. And Dr. Singleton, I'm wondering if you can um, help shed some light on the risks that the Delta variant poses over previous variants of the virus. And of course, we all heard about the CDC's updated mask guidance. Help us understand the context around that and, and sort of how we should think about the risks posed by this new variant of the virus. Yes, thank you for that question. One of the things that we have learned about this SARS-CoV-2 virus is that it does behave like other viruses in that viruses need a human host to stay alive. And so they will change themselves um, to stay alive. They, they love to outsmart their hosts or what they think. And so what has happened is that as we had one type of variant, um, the Delta, I'm sorry, the Alpha variant that was seen in the earlier part of the pandemic, the virus got smart and said, hmm, these people are trying to outsmart me, so I will outsmart them. And so now our new strain evolved called the Delta variant. And what viruses do is because again, their sole purpose is to find the human host. This one changed its coat or its outside protection pieces of it. And it has become much more contagious, much more contagious so that even with smaller amounts, it gets into the system faster. It produces itself stronger and because our older Americans, our older citizens, our older residents were the first ones to be vaccinated and really went all in on being vaccinated, the virus couldn't go there. So where is it going now? It's going to younger and younger people. And because it has adapted itself to become super stronger faster, it now when it goes after the younger people, it's much more infectious, it can spread faster, and therefore is causing more problems. And so as a result, um, the vaccination process is even more important. We have learned both real world effectiveness that the vaccines, all three of those that are approved by the Federal Food and Drug Administration work against the previous variant and they work against this one. As late as just this past week, we're continually testing and we see that it is protecting people against these variants. 
The challenge though, is what we're seeing is that in a very small number of people, they are still getting infected. The good part is that, again, the vaccines are doing what they are supposed to do. They are keeping people out of being seriously hospital and they are keeping people from dying. But we are seeing that the Delta variant is still sneaking through in some cases, which is why more people need to get vaccinated. And Dr. Amergluck, maybe you can walk us through just how vaccines get evaluated, particularly for you know kids ages 12 and up. What was what were the trials like for that? How much knowledge and, and time of evaluation do we have about them? So, you know, um, I spend a lot of my time addressing vaccine hesitancy. Actually, as a pediatrician, we have had to address vaccine hesitancy uh, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. Uh, because of the um, many of the childhood vaccines uh, start at birth or shortly thereafter. If you think about the clinical trials that all of these vaccines go, whether it's before uh, this pandemic or during this pandemic, they follow a process. We have regulatory bodies that monitor, you know, uh, moving from what we call phase one all the way through the uh, phase two, three, four post licensure studies. So we we hold a standard that is. Uh, not rigid, but it is set there, you know, and established for decades before this pandemic. What's happened though, is that post, when the pandemic started, we started to run things in parallel and not in series, whereas what, which is what we had done before. So you, it, maybe it takes, uh, you know, X years to do phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on, leading to a culmination of more than a decade. In this pandemic, it's, it, there's been a unique partnership with the federal and the pharmaceutical industry uh, to try to work together and pool our resources so that we can generate 30,000 or 40,000 trial participants, volunteers in a very short time. Uh, so to get us through the phases more quickly because we are basically lo lobbying all of our resources to try to recruit from all over the country, uh, not just in the US, but elsewhere. And that's part of how we've gotten these trials um, to the phase three that you guys are hearing about in the news. Same goes for kids. Once we have determined that the safety issue and kind of like we see the efficacy issues that we have been reported with all the uh, FDA EUA approved vaccines that you've heard about, we then move towards the children. We start with our adolescent group and then follow the same process. And then we keep moving on down. Currently, there are studies right now that are happening for our uh, up, upwards of uh, greater than six months of age and on up uh, as we uh, continue to try to vaccinate uh, the 12 to and up uh, children uh, that can receive the FDA EUA approved vaccine. Um, and Dr. Singleton, maybe walk us through some of the conversations you might be having with folks about we're thinking about maybe their kids are going to college where some of these colleges are requiring vaccination to be on campus or you know for kids who are going to high school it's being encouraged vaccination is encouraged for everybody how do you talk to parents or even kids who are considering whether to get the shot what kinds of things come up and, and what do you tell them well i'll start with you know close to home i happen to be the the best job i have is the mom of being a mother of a 15 year old and so during this past school year, he was very fortunate to be in a school setting here in Atlanta, Georgia, where he had the opportunity to be in face-to-face -face learning. And luckily his school did follow as many layered strategies as possible, social distancing and masks. But when the vaccination became available, he's not only needle phobic, meaning he doesn't like needles, but he didn't want to get the shot. And so I reminded him, one of the, again, that is the best job in the world is being his mother. I'm also the mother of an asthmatic son. And so I reminded him of the, some of the scariest times of being a mom, as well as a pediatrician by training, to see your child huffing and puffing to breathe. And I reminded him, he probably doesn't remember many times, so the times, that we, the few times, thank goodness, that we've been in the emergency department where he was struggling to breathe and then mommy couldn't do anything about it. We were there, but it breaks your heart as a parent, as a physician to see that happen. And so I reminded him of, do you really want that to happen again? And so this virus could possibly start to cause problems with you breathing, which would not only 
keep you out of school, keep you away from soccer that you love, keep you away from your friends, but it would also could potentially take you away from us. And you are our greatest blessing, our greatest joy. So yes, you may be a little scared of getting a needle. Yes, you may be afraid of, well, I've heard these things may happen. But the trade-off of that is that you get to get this vaccine and be back and be healthy with us. And so for that reason, he said, okay, fine. Plus at the time, he was able to take his mask off. Those things have changed, but that's why he was able to get into that process. And so we had that conversation with several of the adolescents at his school who were a little uncertain and some of their parents, because the parents were like, well, I'm not really sure, it's not really known. But because of some of the considerations that my colleague mentioned, with these young people, side effects may be of sore arms or being tired, but taking a child out of school, out of their lives, is something that we as a community don't want to see happen. And so the, I, I offer that to parents. I offer that to our young people. I have a colleague whose daughter is about to attend Spelman College here this fall. And the mother is very, very concerned. And so she and I had a long conversation about this and I offered to her, think about how your daughter you want her to be able to experience life as an 18, 19, 20 year old. You want her to be able to see her friends in college. You want her to be able to be on campus and be in these opportunities. And it may seem to be a little scary. And you think about the trade-off to get her to have that space, give her the best opportunity to live her best life and please get her vaccinated. And so my colleague is getting her child vaccinated right now. That's awesome. Um, I wonder, Dr. Emmerhook, you know, some people might have heard um, about these very rare risks uh, with the COVID vaccines, uh, like uh, heart inflammation uh, that some people get after getting the shot. Um, can you put into context just what the risk is of something like that happening from vaccination um, versus what the risks are from COVID, um, which is spreading so fast right now? So, Yes, and um, you know one of the things that uh, we are really fortunate to have is a monitoring system that um, through CDC uh, that we track and continually track people who are receiving the FDA EUA vaccines uh, so that we can um, look at any uh, kind of increased signaling of any kind of side effects. So that being said, what's not getting um, making out there in the news is the risk for disease or risk for infection uh, we know cases and hospitalizations, and also, like I had mentioned earlier, the MISC syndrome, the multi-inflammatory, which does involve the cardiac system. If you look at the rates or proportion of among MISC overall, and then you look at uh, kids who get uh, myocarditis or pericarditis post-vaccination, of which, by the way, uh, most of them all recovered without any problem, and in fact, even hospitalization. Um, so we have to balance that out. Now I understand I'm a, uh, a, a parent as well. Um, and as a pediatrician, you know, like I've said, we've had to talk about every vaccine we have, we see side effects, right? Um, but it's a risk benefit. To me, uh, as an, a parent, uh, I would take that, I have, uh, both my kids are vaccinated um, to, to prevent them from getting long haul syndrome, to be, prevent them from getting myocarditis that's from the germ itself, to me, uh, that's a much bigger risk, much bigger risk for complications as compared to the risk of developing myocarditis or pericarditis uh, with uh, one of the uh, FDA EUA approved vaccines. The other thing I'll mention is, you know, the side effects that we hear about that are most common, actually the most common ones are the ones that show us that our body actually is mounting an immune response, right? Fever, feeling tired, uh, maybe just uh, uh, feeling a little bit um, uh, sleepy or, you know, th things are, to me, whether you get the flu vaccine or you get the COVID vaccine, those are common symptoms, and that is to be expected. Definitely. Um, Dr. Singleton, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to, you were talking about the, the new mask guidance with the Delta variant. You know, some people have kind of seen that and, and thought, Okay, so I have to wear a mask even if I'm fully vaccinated. Why do I? Why do I want to get fully vaccinated then? Can you just talk about sort of the layers of protection um, that we might need now? Sure, and I'm sure it's very, very frustrating if you have gone to the taken that step that we've all have been asked to do and get vaccinated, 
And the original thinking was that the vaccine would let you lose your mask. What we are finding with this Delta variant, as I mentioned before, that it's really, really sneaky. And so the vaccines are protecting you against getting really, really sick and being in the hospital and dying. What we have found though, that this, there are a few people that where the, vac, um, where the variant is coming, can come in, still give you an infection. It will be a mild infection, but it can still be transmitted to other people, meaning it can be spread to other people. And that piece, we don't yet know how long that happens. And so because we still have a large population that has not been vaccinated or cannot be vaccinated right now, our children in particular, and that is why we are being asked to, even if you are vaccinated and live in an area where the var there's low vaccination rates, to, cons to put your mask back on. And because it's basically like um, stirring um, liquid into a drink. If it's a large amount in that pool, then it's much more likely to, be infect to get infected. So in certain parts of the country, like here in Atlanta, here in Georgia, in the South, we have a lot of unvaccinated people and we have a lot of a Delta variant running around. So even though you are vaccinated and you are protected against severe disease, there is still a chance that you might accidentally, not really intending to, transmit that, vi that virus to someone else, to again, these young children that can't yet get vaccinated. And so for those reasons, the CDC has uh, updated its guidance to su strongly suggest that in addition to social distancing in these areas, in addition to getting vaccinated, to wear your mask. But our primary way of protecting our people, our country, your pe the people that you love and care for is to get vaccinated. Yeah, I guess, and just to follow up on that, you know, some folks say, okay, well, so the vaccine doesn't work. It's not that it doesn't work, right? You know, right. You still get a benefit from being vaccinated, a benefit to yourself. And you get a benefit to others because, again, you are dropping those caseloads down. You're dropping, again, that virus is trying to find a susceptible person. It's trying to find someone who doesn't have that protective coat. Well, the more people that get vaccinated, that virus is bumping up against people. Think of it like a pinball machine. That virus is like the pinball. It's bouncing around. And so if every pillar in that pin con that machine is a vaccinated person, that virus has no place to go and it just goes right on down the drain. So it's going to keep bouncing. So we need to put more and more barriers up against that virus. The more and more people get it that are vaccinated, the less places this virus has to go. And Dr. Imrig, like you mentioned at the beginning, you have a lot of conversations about uh, people who have questions about uh, getting vaccines of all kinds, not just for COVID. What kind of advice do you have um, about how providers should be talking with patients about considering vaccines and in particular the COVID vaccines? So there have been many studies to try to uh, look at how to address vaccine hesitancy pre-COVID. And some of the findings from the studies have shown that, you know, when we talk about who, who does somebody trust, I'm talking now from a parent standpoint and, or a caregiver, with a child as opposed to uh, adult population. Uh, the primary care provider is their number one trusted source. And it's come through, you know, again and again. The other person actually is the mother. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, relying on who to go to as their trusted source. So I think uh, the tenets that we've learned from uh, the vaccine hesitancy, how to address it. And I think also as a pediatrician, um, there's a acronym, we call it CASE. Um, and the C stands for cooperate. So, you know, when you engage and talk with families about vaccinations, you have to engage them as a partner. Uh, it, it can't be uh, prescriptive as far as, you know, this is what you have to do, uh, but rather listening to them. Uh, and I think in COVID pandemic times, the reasons for the hesitancy are varied. And we have to really listen to our communities. And we have to really uh, try to uh, share with them uh, the A, kind of the advice, um, and, and also explain to them your expertise. Why is it that you know more? Uh, maybe it's based on the information that's been shared through the public health forum or just your background. As a pediatric infectious disease specialist, uh, I try to continually update myself with the science that's coming out, and it's coming out fast. And then S is the science. You know, I, I am a firm believer that evidence-based medicine and science ought to drive our decision-making. And what's uncomfortable and unsettling during this pandemic is the fact that 
that information is continually changing because we're starting to, we continually learn more and more about this virus. We continually learn more and more about the consequences of infection, the long haul syndrome that we didn't talk about very much the early pandemic because we didn't know. Now a year and a half or more into this, we start to see the consequences of those who have been infected. And lastly, E, explain, advise, but with a listening ear, with compassion. And I think that's what people need to hear in an approach that works pre-pandemic as well as during this pandemic. Dr. Singleton, I wonder if you can tell us, you know, as folks are getting ready to go back to school or it's even starting up in some places, um, about how they should plan for vaccination because um, the vaccine that's available for kids down to age 12 is two shots, right? So maybe tell us about um, just how you have to space them out, what you should do when you only have one shot, all of those considerations. Sure, so there are two, a couple things is that the only vaccine that is available for children ages 12 to 17 is the Pfizer vaccine. It is a two shot series and they have to be spaced 21 days apart. So if you get your first shot on, let's say October, um, August 1st, you have to wait 21 days before you get your second shot. So um, in that process, um, you know, again, work with your child to let them know what is going to happen to them. Um, anecdotally, we have found that um, kids who drink a lot of fluids um, that may have less of some of those normal reactions that my colleague was mentioning, because that shows that your body is taking on and doing what it needs to do. So that they may, keyword may, um, have some mild pain at the injection site. They may, keyword may, feel tired a little bit afterwards. They may, keyword may, you know, may have a headache or a stomach ache. And some kids may have no reactions at all. I had the opportunity to support a vaccine clinic at, again at my son's school. And we saw over 400 kids one particular day and following up on those kids, some were really tired the next day. And then by day two, they were up and at them again. And then some kids um, had no issues whatsoever. So those are the things to, to remind your child that so what, what could happen to them. Um, the second shot is 21 days later. And then two weeks after that second dose, the child is considered fully vaccinated. If by chance the vaccine happens, let's say again with our example, October, I'm sorry, August the 1st, and school starts on August the 5th, the child will be partially vaccinated. Um, but we still really, really, really encourage you to get the second shot unless there's absolutely no reason that they can't get it. But there's, there's always, there's plenty of vaccine around. They should get that second shot. Another key piece is part of the safety monitoring part that was brought up earlier is that CDC has a very, very strong safety monitoring program called the Vaccine Adverse Event Program with something even better that we found called Be Safe. And so if you have a smartphone, when your child is vaccinated, you can enroll in Be Safe by scanning a QR code. And so what we do as CDC is that we follow each person and just ask them every day, how are you feeling? Do you have any symptoms or side effects? And if there is something more than headache, fever, then one of our staff follows up with that individual. We are still following people. I got my two vaccines in March. It is now the end of July almost, and I'm still getting followed up on. My, again, my 15-year-old is still getting those follow-up pieces of it. So we take this very seriously, and we check in on anyone who may be having some concerns. But those are the things to expect if your child is going to be vaccinated. And we encourage everyone to get their kids vaccinated. Well, I want to uh, remind folks you can submit questions for our experts, and uh, we'll be getting to those uh, pretty soon. Um, I just wanted to follow up something uh, you said, Dr. Immergluck, that we're learning more because now we've been in this pandemic for what, a year and a half, it feels like forever, um, but we've seen the effects of long COVID because it's been going on for so long. Do we see much long COVID in kids, um, or is it really the MISC that's the thing to really worry about? for COVID for kids? No, we, we do see long haul in kids. Um, and uh, we see it uh, in our um, young 
uh, adolescents through our late adolescent age groups. Um, and so again, uh, I think uh, things uh, with the longer that we're in this and the longer that we have uh, people who are unvaccinated, um, you know, uh, hitting our young adult populations, uh, you know, that again, increases that transmission community level transmission, putting our children who are not able to get vaccinated at risk so that, you know, with time, um, you know, they, we may be seeing more and more evidence of uh, higher proportions of kids with other complications associated with post COVID infections. And so a lot of that still remains unknown, but I would rather us, you know, band together and not see that. Um, I really can't not emphasize how important it is for those who are eligible, especially our young adults, our 18 to 29 year olds. I'm, I'm so disheartened uh, when I think about um, that they are the lowest uh, proportionally uh, group to get vaccinated in our country uh, and here in Georgia, uh, especially. Um, I, I feel like, you know, they don't recognize that they are potentially, you know, going to get complications. They just don't realize it um, as far as these long haul syndromes. That's helpful. Um, Dr. Singleton, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about just how to access the vaccine. I mean, can we talked, we heard about this a little bit from Dr. Nunez Smith, you know, are schools vaccination sites, is that something folks should be looking for? Pediatricians offices, your local pharmacy, are these all options for getting the shot? Well, you have a combination. Luckily right now, we've got lots and lots and lots of locations. Early on in the uh, vaccine process, we did not have as many um, locations, but now we have our, your local physician, maybe a, a location. If you go to vaccines.gov, um, and I can put that in the chat, there is a vaccine finder. And so you can look, put your zip code in and you can see the locations that are nearest to you. Um, I will give a slight promotion here again in Atlanta. If anyone is here in Atlanta, Georgia, near South DeKalb Mall, um, because I know this because I will be participating in it. There will be an event at South DeKalb Mall at the gallery at South DeKalb from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. this Saturday. Again, as Dr. Nunes Smith said, the vaccine is free. And so you can go there this Saturday and get your vaccine and your kids can get the vaccine. Schools um, can be sites. And again, I'm happy to drop into the chat. Um, your school could be a location um, to get organized and have the vaccines brought to you. Um, we have several pharmacies, the CVSs, the Walgreens, the Kroger's. You can walk right in and get a shot at any time there as well. And um, Dr. Immerglug, um, as you think about, you know, everybody coming back to school, how do you weigh the risks and benefits for kids um, in the context of the recommendations on masks and vaccines? So I always um, make a reference to risk tolerance um, and thinking about what are factors that we each think about that need to contribute to what our risk tolerance is. And I would hope that people um, who interface with, as an educator, uh, um, as a parent, or as a student, uh, think about that in our in our K through 12 systems um, to have very low tolerance for any kind of risk. And I know that uh, you had mentioned about the layered prevention strategy. I really think that that is something we need to lean into as we think about school systems making decisions on and developing guidelines. I hope they will draw upon what has been uh, put forward by both CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics on this matter. Uh, because to me, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, very, very low tolerance for any kind of risk is what we ought to be aiming for. So I'm 100% uh, endorsing the use of that layered prevention strategy where we try to, at this point, uh, because we have a, such a high number of children still not able to get vaccinated, to use the mask if you're able to over two. Uh, and for our uh, adults uh, and also older population to get vaccinated um, and um, also to keep up with the masking and physical distancing if possible. Uh, so that mitigation strategy is always part of that layer. Well, I wanna take a question we got from the audience, Dr. Singleton, maybe I'll post to you. Um, somebody asks if my child gets vaccinated and had medical problems as a result, who would take responsibility? 
Well, we again, this is a the United States has a vaccine safety monitoring program. And again, it's called the Vaccine Adverse Event System. And so if someone uh, believes that they have medical concerns after receiving any vaccine, not just the COVID vaccine, they or their healthcare provider are invited to report the said symptoms to that um, that process. And so those are being those will be investigated. And so that's where we better understand the connection between what had, what may have happened to the individual and a connection to the vaccine or not. Sometimes when things happen, they happen to be true, true and not necessarily related. But this vaccine adverse event monitoring system is very, very thorough and your situation will be investigated and studied to make sure that everything is all on the okay and on the up and up. Um, you know, Dr. Inber, look, I want to return to some of these conversations that you have around hesitancy and so much of what we've heard about uh, in terms of what's happening with COVID is that there's just a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of myths, and these are just very widespread. I wonder, you know, what kind of conversations do you have and do you, are there any myth busters you, you want to put out there for folks now? And Dr. Singleton, I'll ask the same to you after I ask Dr. Inber Gluck. Yeah, we, we've been doing a lot uh, along that front. Um, we are part of the um, SEAL uh, NIH initiative, um, a part of Georgia SEAL, SEAL's an acronym um, to address uh, COVID disparities. Um, but a big part of that is centered around um, discussing vaccine hesitancy, particularly among communities of color. Um, we have a community engagement team um, that is sole purpose is to uh, address different communities, work with our community-based partners and organizations to address vaccine hesitancy. We have a youth advisory group. Uh, it's a board of um, actually students from our Atlanta University Consortium, um, including students from Morehouse School of Medicine, Morehouse College, Spelman, and Clark, Atlanta, uh, and also has now opened up to the wider community to talk of, to our youth. Some of them actually are not necessarily, they're sitting on the fence with vaccine. We want to hear about what it is that makes them sit on the fence. Uh, I think that you really have to listen to the um, reasons because it's not all the same. So when we talk about infertility, for example, concerns around that, um, we have to understand what is their understanding? What's being put out there? And not just say, well, it's not, it's not true. Uh, same, similar with other, some of the other uh, myths and misinformation that's being put out there. I think it's coming down to the root of that and then being able to show the science and the data to disprove that. I'll give you an example if I can. Um, one of my medical students on a summer internship project uh, decided to throw out TikTok that she just wanted to do a simple little study to look at what was the response to a TikTok addressing infertility uh, as far as uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. And she, within 72 hours of this being out there, uh, she got over a thousand replies or hits. And one of them was uh, a person who quoted a scientific journal and she said, why do I read about um, X percent rate of miscarriages? But what happened was, was that person actually didn't have the full story. So this new medical student went back and pulled the original journal from New England Journal actually, uh, and saw that she only took half of that. The half was the rate with a study, but didn't talk about how small that is proportionally to the general population for miscarriages. So in the truth of the matter is that the risk for miscarriage in this context of COVID vaccination is less than the risk of miscarriage for the general population. Therefore, it's not really a risk, right? But that had to be explained to her uh, in this blog. Um, but anyway, that's the kind of uh, level that I'm saying that we need to address and listen to our communities for the different myths that they're hearing. Dr. Singleton, do you have thoughts on that? What do you hear and, and uh, what kinds of conversations like that are you having? Sure, so we often hear um, one of the most common ones early on, again, but particularly with communities of color, is that the vaccine contained um, metal in it that would cause the federal government to track people or that people were being microchipped. I recall actually doing one of our local clinics here in Atlanta and a gentleman came and he said, okay, now, is this the shot that I get the microchip or is the second shot? And so 
as Dr. Emma Gluck was saying, is you know, it takes time to explain to people that there is nothing in these vaccines that contains metal. There is nothing in these vaccines that can track people. Actually, your cell phone can be followed more so than any sort of vaccine process. So it's the, taking the time to walk through some of these. I uh, We did a call with our colleagues over at Clark Atlanta, and we talked about trusted agents. And sometimes Dr. TikTok is perceived as the trusted agent. And so we have to, as Dr. Emma Gluck was saying, so can I break down who Dr. TikTok is and what's there? So sometimes people, well, our young women in particular, and their parents are very, concerned about the potential for fertility. And part of that is sometimes a little confusing because they see information saying that if you are pregnant and get COVID, that you have a chance of a worse outcome. So sometimes people think, well, that means if I get the vaccine, then I will have problems as well. And it's actually not true. And we explained to them that you don't want to get COVID. The, the bottom line is don't get COVID. And several women were pregnant in the trials. Several women have become pregnant during while they were vaccinated and all their babies have been healthy. And so once you track through that process and speak about that aspect of it and that fertility has not been a concern, then people breathe a better sigh of relief. But what we again continue to underscore is what you don't want is getting COVID. And yes, even though your child, your young adult may have mild symptoms or may seem no big deal. What we're seeing is that sometimes that their educational attainment is dropping off. So again, as a parent, you don't want to, why would you want to short circuit your child's best opportunity for learning? If I, God willing, my now 15 year old goes to college, I want him to have all oars in the water so that he can learn the best. And if he's slowed down because of he's had, unfortunately had two, three weeks of COVID, then I'm not doing him a disservice. I'm doing him a disservice. And so we want these kids vaccinated. And again, it's helping them in the short term and the long term. Question from the audience, which I think I'll post to you, Dr. Singleton, but I'll ask Dr. Emma Gluck to weigh in on her thoughts too, uh, which is, is there any chance schools will ever be able to require proof of vaccines from students, staff, and teachers in K through 12 schools? What do you think? Well, a lot right now, I think for some of the hesitation right now um, in that setting is because the vaccine is not, it's under the, what we call emergency use authorization. And so um, they are, they, we do have precedent where there are vaccines that have already been through the full renewal process. And so when your child goes to school, you have to show proof of measles, mumps, chickenpox, et cetera. So, you know, further down the line, this could be one of those um, mandated vaccines. But right now, we're just really, really encouraging individuals to be vaccinated in these younger groups um, and our adolescents so that we don't have our younger kids getting sick. Dr. McGluck, thoughts on that? Well, I'm hoping because people recognize um, that we are in a pandemic, people are still dying, people are still getting seriously infected and ill and hospitalized, and our children, you know, many of our children remain vulnerable because they can't actually get the vaccine, that we would think outside the, of that, and think within that construct and framework to say that um, these FDA uh, approved vaccines for emergency use authorization during a pandemic uh, is necessary. I am very proud um, at Morehouse School of Medicine, we have a mandate that you are required to have the vaccine vaccination, a, COVID, a, valid, vac a valid FDA EUA approved uh, COVID vaccine. And, uh, and we, we have a great prevention, uh, layered prevention strategy. We have regular cadence of testing, uh, we monitor that um, even while we are trying to get everybody vaccinated, our students, our staff, our employees, everybody. Um, we also uh, try to uh, go anywhere and everywhere to help uh, lift that vaccination opportunity to underserved uh, populations and rural communities uh, in our local kind of metro Atlanta area. Uh, you know, we spent uh, during the priority period when they were being rolled out, training all our medical students and our PA students to give vaccinations so they can go out into communities. Our parking deck was a vaccination uh, forum uh, for people who were over 70 at that time to come in and get a, a vaccine. 
Um, so I, I, you know, I, I just want us to be uh, uh, pausing on that. Now, my one of my kids are going to school in California, uh, public school, and they're going to be they're in a school that they're mandating vaccination for all their students. So I'm just saying that, you know, I understand about the licensure issue, but I'm asking us, you know, all to really pause and think about this. We're in a pandemic. And if we have a vaccine that has demonstrated to have efficacy uh, to save lives, um, I think we ought to think about how, how we uh, develop guidelines around that. Well, I think we're just about at the end of our time. Um, I'll ask for any final thoughts uh, from, from each of you, although those were great thoughts, Dr. Emmerglick. Um, Dr. Singleton, any parting words you wanna give folks? Yes, please, please, please get vaccinated. That is our best, best, best um, fight against this horrible virus. Um, it prevents severe illness. It prevents severe hospitalizations. Most importantly, it prevents death. These vaccines are all extremely safe. And the faster we can get our communities vaccinated and protected, this virus will have no place to go. And so we have the power to make this happen and we have the power to protect our young people. Vaccination, as well as other layered strategies can help this virus go away. So please join us and get your families vaccinated. Thank you. Dr. Emmerglick, any last thoughts? Yeah, so I understand this audience is primarily uh, people who have concerns around our children. So I would like to encourage all of us to really think about the risk tolerance of, one, of seeing children uh, become ill uh, becoming at risk to get NISC or the uh, long haul. And then ask yourself, you know, um, what, what is your risk tolerance for that? And then think about that layered prevention strategy, whether your community is your household, whether your community is your school system, and be a part of that conversation. Be an active part of your school system uh, to tell them what you think about. Find out who your trusted source is and ask your trusted source uh, what is the evidence? What's the science behind whether or not uh, your child or your community of vulnerable children uh, should get vaccinated? Well, thank you both so much. This was enlightening and uh, really, really helpful. And thanks to everybody for submitting uh, really great questions. Um, and I'm going to send it over to uh, Brittany again. Great. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, and we really appreciate the time and the expertise that you've shared with us tonight, Dr. Zimmergluck and Dr. Singleton. Um, before we close, we would like to acknowledge that we do have a, a couple of resources that we would like to share with the audience. So at the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network, um, we essentially connect individuals and families to resources that are nearby in their neighborhoods, but we also work with a coordinated structured network of CBOs and federal agencies to connect them to resources that might be related to the entire country, um, your particular neighborhood, your state, or even your county. So we do encourage you to join our network and connect with us via our website. You can certainly email, email us any questions that you may have after this event. And we also have a call center that is available to connect with you between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. every day of the week. If you visit our website, you'll find key tools like things like a symptom checker so that you continue to monitor your symptoms as the pandemic continues. You can check the risk in your area and you can also find testing resources nearby. In addition to this, we do have an app that is available in the Google Play and Apple App Store that we encourage you to visit. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Rhonda Holliday as she'll close out this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Um, first, I'd like to thank our moderator, Meg, for um, hosting our conversation this evening on this very critical and important discussion. And I'd also like to thank Drs. Emma Gluck and Singleton for sharing your time and expertise with us this evening. I'd like to take a moment to thank our partners at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Region 4, Equity Count, Equity excuse me, for Health Equity Council for co-hosting this event with us and a special thank you to all that attended this evening. 
for all parents, teachers, educators, and healthcare providers tuned in this evening. We welcome you to join the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network to stay up to date with new COVID-19 information and resources. And as Brittany has already um, described, we do have a website as well as an app and a multicultural hotline that you can call at 1-877-904-5097. Again, thank you for joining us this evening and have a great night.